right? So I start you on this right oblique and I can keep shoving that right oblique forward, right? I have space that I can do that, right? I can lose all of my internal rotation by shoving you all the way forward. Good morning, happy Monday. I have neural coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right, man, coming off of a great weekend. Looking forward to a very, very busy week this week, um, which reminds me, we have an iFast University Q&A at 1 p.m. Eastern time for those of you who are iFast University members. And if you're not, please get yourself signed up so you can participate in that this afternoon. Uh, today's Q&A is with Cameron. And so Cameron had some clarifying questions in regards to some of uh, the uh, pelvis orientation that we talk about. And so we talked about different types of turns. We talked about uh, the right oblique orientation and how that arises and then how that influences the center of gravity. Um, even making reference to um, how we would recognize this in, in the foot. So if you're looking at those relationships and you still have questions, this is gonna be a great call for you. If you would like to participate in a 15 minute consultation, please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com, put a 15 minute consultation in the subject line so I do not delete it. Um, gotta um, take off, I've got a very, very busy day. You guys have a great week and I will see you tomorrow. All right, we are recording. Timer has started. Cameron, what is your question? All right, so I was uh, in my head, I get a little bit confused about and uh, the difference between more that kind of flatter oblique turn from like the left side versus yep. the up and over to the right side. Yep. And um, yeah, so I guess I was just kind of wondering if you can kind of walk walk me through kind of this shape change difference between. Yeah, the two. sure, absolutely. It's a it's it's fairly straightforward. Um, so th both are defending against against an internal force that's trying to turn you. Okay, so that's the one thing that you have to recognize is that, is that both strategies, one, they're going to be idiosyncratic, so it's going to be a structurally driven decision, okay? okay. And, but, but again, both are defending against the same, the same force. So this is an internally driven force that's trying to knock you off your feet to your left, okay? okay. And that's, again, we don't really have a choice in that regard unless, unless your, your internal organs are, are flip-flopped and then it goes the other way, okay? Gotcha. All right. And so again, it's just a bias. All right. And so, so when we, when we're talking about, so, so I have to have some way to manage something that's trying to push me this way. The way I always describe it is, is that if you were, if you're standing in a really strong current in a river mm -hmm. and that river is trying to knock you off your feet to your left and what would you do? Well, you would turn into the current. Gotcha. So, so that's all this is, is, is just a, a strategy. Okay? okay. And then how tall are you? Uh, six, two. Okay. So you're taller than me. Okay. So it stands to reason that my strategy and your strategy would be somewhat different be just because of our physical structure. Correct. Right. Yeah. So you're going to turn differently than I am. And that's all we're talking about. So we've got, so what, but what we want to do is we want to represent the extremes knowing full well that there is an infinite number of possibilities in between those two extremes. So the right. one extreme would be for me to, to just take this and then just turn it actually just turn it like that. Okay. Okay. And so this is going to be a very flat kind of a turn. Okay. Gotcha. But what that does is it gets the paddle in the water out in front of you, basically. That's what it does. Yeah. So, so it, it, it pushes that sucker forward like that. Okay. And would but, that be kind of similar to if it was like a, like a, like a posterior lower compressive? Oh so yeah. So, so that, that's a, that's, that, that's representative of a, of a later propulsive strategy. Sure. Later propulsive strategy. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I got to push it out there. Right. I got to I got to get away to turn. I have to create a turn. And so when you think about late propulsion, so what late propulsion does is it turns the sacrum away. So if I need to turn the sacrum into the current, so to speak, I got to push it out there. So what's the best way to do that? Well, under certain circumstances, it's going to be use a late propulsive strategy, which okay. is why you see a lot of people in that that late propulsive strategy. OK, now gotcha. there's another way that I can do that instead of grabbing in the, with the posterior lower down here is I just, I grab right there where my, my middle finger is. And so yeah. if I do that, what happens is, is this side goes up. You see it? Mm. You see how it goes up? Right. Okay. And so it goes up, but it still turns the sacrum. I still achieve my goal of turning the sacrum. 
yeah. in the other uh, um, to the uh, to the right to the right yeah yeah and so that's the difference and so but 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 again these are different representations of of muscle activity in regards to how the the pelvis is going to behave so I still get my turn right but now you can see that I'm I'm tilting the sacrum on on a much more oblique axis which is why I just call it a right oblique orientation right gotcha so you see the difference in the two yeah yeah. And yeah, so, you know, if, if you look at, if you look at some of the differences, when, when you see somebody in the flatter turns, mm -hmm. because I'm using this posterior, th this, this lower aspect of, of the musculature, you know, on, down, down so low, I'm mm -hmm. going to see these people. So these are the people that lose early hip flexion. These are people with a lousy straight leg raise, mm -hmm. right? These are people with the, that lack internal rotation, gotcha. right? This guy's still going to lose internal rotation by traditional measures, but chances are he's going to have a better straight leg raise and he's going to have early hip flexion. And, so then, but, and, then maybe the, and then the right side would probably have a loss of some of the ER measures. like Correct, because less, I'm tipping up, I'm tipping, so I'm tipping up and over over this right hand side here. So mm -hmm. I tip up and over. So I'm going to lose my E. Like I, I think about it. It's just, and I'm I just going to give you this, this profile view. So if I yeah. push up and over and I push that hip forward, Look at all this musculature that changes its orientation from ER to IR. Oh, right. Because everything above the trochanter is going into Correct. IR. Yeah. So, so, you know, it. it, it mm. the, the, all right. That makes sense to me. Right. So, so, so now that you have the two extremes in your head. Yeah. The thing that, like I said, the thing that you have to recognize is that I, how many possibilities are in between the two? Yeah, I guess that's what I get the most confused of when they're on the table is I'm, I'm like, well, right. but, but the rules, but, but the rules are the rules same. Go. The okay. rules are the same, right? So you, as long as you understand the two extremes, it's kind of like looking at, if you look at a wide ISA archetype and a narrow ISA archetype, those are the two mm -hmm. extremes and everybody's right. in between there, right? And every mm -hmm. once in a while, you're going to get one of those like really crazy outlier people that are like way out in, into one side and it makes it like slam dunk easy. It's like, oh, this is going to be, you know, you get one of those people with the gigantically wide ISAs that, that, that can't close it at all. And you go, okay, I know exactly what to do here. And you go to the other extreme and you get the person that, that wa walks in, you can't, you can't even get your thumbs between your thumbs in there. Their, their, their ribs, you know? Um, yeah. But, but again, that's all, that's all we're looking at here um, in, in regards to a, a defense against a force. That's, that's what it is. It's a, it's a force that's being driven against you at all times. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And I guess my follow-up to that is like, um, is like, how, how do you, so I, let's say if, sorry, I kind of have my guy here too, I guess. Uh -huh. Is if, uh, in terms of the, the flatter, the flatter turn with the left going forward versus, versus the, versus the oblique going over to the side, how, like how, how would maybe my early interventions, um, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you enough context because I know you always follow up well. Like it well depends. Well, um, context context makes everything easy because we can say in this representation we have this, and then we can actually give a demonstration of the of the rules. So just gotcha. Okay. So so I guess a really common presentation or I think of a couple people I have in the clinic right now where they they all have like that like bilateral like posterior lateral uh, or excuse me posterior compression, mm -hmm. and then and then they have a little bit of it of like that right oblique kind of uh turn yep. right there yep um so i was kind of at least my interpretation at the moment is to kind of go like bottom up to make sure they can get enough like hip flexion to get close well what, what can like, you do without it yeah uh, no, nothing, nothing really <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so so i mean and again th these are the people that um they're if, if they're supine on the table and you and you and you take one of their their lower extremities and you try to move it it's like right away you feel that resistance just kicking in against you and you're going like uh oh okay we've yeah. got an you, you know a lot of times you, you have somebody that that's that's sort of like this end game representation where all the posterior lower is concentrically oriented and and if you don't if you don't manage that first you don't have a whole lot of space to work with gotcha yeah and then how and so let's say like once that's uh, let's say if we have someone that doesn't have that severe of that posterior compressive strategy but they're more of that kind of oblique turn yep to that to that right yep. side yep um i guess i i i kind of struggle with with picturing how to or or, or like how how we're changing the forces to 
create that like helical angle back without just pushing further back towards the left side. Which well, you might <clears throat> see, that's the thing that this is why we're talking about when we, when we talk about extremes versus a progressive degree of, of difference. The general rule is I have to move you back on the same axis that pushed you there. Okay. Right. So, so if, if, if the axis is here, then I have to bring you back on that axis. If the axis is here, I have to bring you back on that axis. Right. Because it's, okay. it's the entire pelvis that's, that's orienting in that direction. So, so if I, if I try, okay, so here's, what's going to happen. Okay. So if I'm on a right oblique, <clears throat> if I'm on a right oblique, okay. And I try to push you back on this side, what's yeah. going to happen. If I try to push you straight back on the left, what's going to happen? Just, the whole thing would just orient over the best. Yeah, side. exactly. Exactly right. It's like, so, so guess what? So here's one of these things. I got here with relative movement. Right. Yeah. Because the whole thing did it. I got here with relative movement. You see? Gotcha. You see? Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so what I need to do then is I need to move you back on the same axis that, that got you here. So I need to do that. Okay. Right, which is why it's right foot lead kind of activities on the on those oblique people is I'm going to push you back into the left. Under and those so, would it feel like for the most part the effort to make that shift happen would be pressure from your right side pushing you back that I way? I hope so. Yeah. Okay. I don't know how else you're gonna. I don't know how else you're gonna do it. Yeah. I, yeah. I guess you'd have to create that compression on the front to get that. Expansion yeah. on the backside. Yeah, I, I have exactly right. Exactly right. I have, to, I have to push back into the left. And again, like I said, this is typically going to be like your, if you're in a staggered stance, it's a right foot lead. If you're in a split stance, it's a right foot lead. Gotcha. Right. And then, um, oh, how are we doing on time? Uh, like three minutes? Yeah, four minutes. Okay. Um, uh, and then I, I so then I, I, I kind of been doing almost a cookie cutter thing right because i kept thinking in my head it, it was uh, like the a posterior compressive strategy on that left side that was pushing up and over and i'm ready to clear that up on a co uh, coaches and coffee call and alex i remember i'd asked that question mm -hmm. um but oh and then i guess um so it, then the other thing would have to really be looking at the perhaps the person's foot to make sure like what part of the gate cycle like they're kind of biased towards to get them out of it to really see that change or, or, or could you at first? It is a, it is a it's a comfort. It, it's certainly a confirmation of what's going on at the pelvis. Okay. Right. So, so, so let's just think about the, Oh, like the earliest possible representation mm -hmm. um, in, in the, in a right oblique is you're going to have an early propulsive foot on the, on the, the lead foot, which would be the right foot. Okay. Okay. Right. So then it would the farther okay. forward, hang on one sec. The farther forward you get pushed because you can continue to go forward. Right. Right. So I start you on this right oblique and I can keep shoving that right oblique forward. Right. I have space that I can do that. Right. I can lose all of my internal rotation by shoving you all the way forward. Okay. Right? So I, I tip you on the right oblique and I shove you from behind. Okay. That's basically what I'm doing. Okay. Gotcha. So I can steal that right, that early representation in the foot. Mm. If I push you farther forward, and now what you're going to see instead of that, instead of the, um, where, where's my foot? Let me get my foot. So instead of the early representation of the foot, you're going to start to see it look like it's going in the middle, right? So, so in the early, in the early right oblique, I'm going to see a foot that looks like that. So I've got I've got straight toes in line with the first first metatarsal, right? But if I shove the center of gravity forward, guess what? The tibia is going to come, right? So the, think about the pelvis moving over top of the foot now, and then you're going to see a you're going to see a foot that looks like that. Mm. And I can still be on the right oblique. I'm just farther forward. So yeah. this is somebody. So typically on a right oblique, what you're going to see is you're going to see the loss of ER on the right, and you're going to see the the maintenance of internal rotation on the right. Unless you get pushed farther forward, then you're going to start to see the loss of internal rotation. Well, I got to get it somewhere because it. So the so the anterior orientation of the pelvis becomes my substitution for hip internal rotation, but it's still going to be demonstrated in the foot because the foot's got to go into an IR position. You see it? Right. Gotcha. So, so basically you're defining how far forward you are. 
yeah. under those circumstances. And that's, that's the loss of IR. So the anti-orientation tells you via loss of ER, the, the forward displacement of your center of gravity tells you by the loss of IR. All right, I'll have to think about that for a little bit. <laughs> well, it's recorded, so there you yeah. go. Yeah, I'll be on the World Wide Web. Nice. Think well, quick. Um, think fast. Oh, geez. How no pressure? <laughs> what, then what would? I guess uh, hopefully it's quick enough. In terms of what would the like, what would the region? Or I don't know if this has a representation like that. But is there in terms of like the representation of like a of that um, like lower posterior compression? Well, where would that be like up in into the rib cage, like in in kind of context? The, the, like the, the posterior lower rib cage. I mean, it, it's be, okay. It'll be posterior yeah, it's iterative, right? Okay. Just gonna repeat. Mm -hmm. It's gonna mm -hmm. repeat. Yeah. Oh, it just keeps repeating the whole way down. All the way up, whole way down. Oh, yep. All right. Oh, so <laughs> it has awesome. to think, think about it. If I'm pushing everything forward, yeah, like everything's eventually moving forward over, mm -hmm. like your center of gravity is gonna shift forward. Everything else has to push forward too. Otherwise, you'd fall backwards, mm -hmm. and we don't like that. Wait, the level are of complexity mixed in with how it kind of simple it is is very confusing. <laughs> the, the 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 rules the rules are are what is simple. It's the recognition that becomes difficult. Yeah. Right? All right. Okay. That makes sense. But, yeah. but if you understand the rule, it's like, how is this rule being applied? Right. That's what you want to recognize. Okay. Gotcha. And then, then that teaches you how the constraints behave. And if you understand the constraints, you understand the rules, then you understand how it's applied. Okay. And then it just reps. It's just exposures, exposures, exposures. Okay. All right. All right, brother. Appreciate it. I'll probably I'll see, you, uh, I'll see you on Thursday. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, Thanks, man. Bro. All right. Have a great day. Yeah, you too.